Yeah. Um, well, well, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, kick off now. But uh, um, again, thanks for, for joining us during your lunch and whatnot and spending your valuable time with us and everything. Um, we've got Neil um, Kellinen and um, Narva, if I'm not mistaken, with Excel Energy. So um, they're kind of filling the niche with like home charging and uh, sharing some of their you know utility programs with us. Um, at least for me, like I have like a like a pretty old house that's from like the 1960s, so there's some like uncertainty of like my you know like my breakers are powerful enough and stuff, so like power and EV and stuff like that. So uh, if if I'm sharing that concern, I'm guessing that others might have concerns of, about like how how they get power up to their garage and um, you know like what kind of programs might be out there to kind of help with that and um, just kind of like what to expect and. Um, you know, some programs out there to kind of save money and um, there's some like discounted rates and stuff like that. So um, exactly what, like, what, what that kind of looks like in practicalities and whatnot. So, um, um, and again, um, I'm on the sustainable transportation team. So just want to thank them and, um, you know, like my industrial division management for letting me be on that and um, letting me have that, you know, workload allowance to kind of do some of these outreach things. and. We're bringing cool partners like Excel Energy in here with us, so I'll, I'll pass the baton to Neil right now, and we'll uh, get going from there. Sounds good. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, no, I'm Neil Callanan, um, as Steve mentioned, on the electric vehicle team uh, with my colleague here uh, today as well to chat electric vehicles, some of the programs that we have. Um, this is Narm and Senna. Um, we're both kind of focused on our residential program and what we're doing for um, you know uh, customers. Um, like us all in the room today, driving vehicles and how we can get charged up in the home. Um, but I'll definitely share a little bit more about um, <coughs> a broader um, strategy and plans for public charging and how we can help um, some of our large commercial customers um, that are operating fleets um, make the transition as well. Um, so we have a lot underway um, as a company and we're really kind of focused um, on electric vehicles. And uh, really just to get started, kind of level set on some of the background there on, on why we're doing that, is that it's really a customer-focused approach um, and it aligns with our broader company strategy of leading the clean energy transition, um, enhancing the customer experience, and keeping bills low for all of our customers. Um, that first one is leading the clean energy transition, and our company is really passionate about that. Um, you know, last year we had made the announcement of uh, moving to carbon-free generation by 2050, um, which was you know the first of its kind in the nation amongst uh, uh, the large utility groups, and so we're super excited about that. And EVs, um, electric vehicles, fit right into that. Um, you can kind of see with that chart there is that as our grid and um, generation portfolio is getting cleaner and cleaner over time, so does driving an electric car. I mean, even just making the switch today from a traditional gas vehicle to uh, to an electric car um, is is so much um, uh, is so much cleaner um, already, and it will, it will continue to be cleaner over time. Uh, the second is a customer experience, um, and that's something that we're, uh, we're very passionate about as well. is is basically reducing the friction to do business with us and making it really easy. And we feel that since we're the new fuel providers for um, electric cars, um, we know that fuel the best. And so we can make that really easy for customers and providing awareness of the benefits of electric vehicles, helping our customers, whether it's a fleet operator or a residential driver, understand what those benefits are and how they, and how they can make that, um, make that switch. The other uh, one is you know, keeping bills low. That's a priority for us. You know, over the over the last um, ten years, um, you know, our bills have largely been can, uh, been flat. Actually, um, an increased uh, load on our system actually helps that and maintain um, load <coughs> since there's more um, you know, more demand need for electricity and that increases kind of the electricity demand portfolio. That's kind of um, lowering those bills. Um, so that's as as a whole, um, you know, why we're in this game. Um, and, and working to provide our customers uh, resources and programs to make that switch. Uh, also, as I, as I talk through this, you know, feel free to jump in with questions and stuff you want to have this you know, be an open discussion. Um, so just let me know. Um, so exactly how are we you know, kind of accomplishing those three areas with electric vehicles? Um, well, last year, we um, basically proposed our Minnesota electric vehicle plan. And it's really focused on three customer segments that we've identified, and that's home charging, fleet charging, and then public charging. 
Um, and those three segments, you know, we've really identified there, there's actually three barriers um, that are across all of those three segments. And one that's just lack of awareness and information. Um, there's not just readily information for um, us as you know, everyday consumers or a fleet operator to really understand the comprehensive benefits and considerations for electric transportation. Um, so we're looking to address that barrier. The second is upfront costs. Um, you know, today, just the upfront purchase price of an electric car is still, on average, more expensive than a traditional gas engine. Um, and that's expected to go down over time and actually in the near future when um, you know, battery technology and other manufacturing processes are supposed to um, imp improve the, that cost delta. Um, but not only is it with the upfront purchase of the car, but the infrastructure to charge it. Um, that electrical infrastructure in a lot of our homes, same with uh, in a lot of fleet garages, is just not readily um, capable to handle uh, a massive transition to electric. And so with that, there's a lot of upfront costs in upgrading the wiring in our homes and in fleet garages and making sure that there's enough power to charge those vehicles or the amount of vehicles that a fleet operator wants. And then third, um, you know, there's some in insufficient incentives um, you have to charge when energy costs are, are low. Um, and so that means how can we best align this new energy um, demand so that our system isn't taking a big hit um, during the day? Um, so we want to encourage overnight charging when actually electricity is the cheapest um, and it's actually the cleanest. That's when we have a lot of wind on our system. Um, so aligning those two things with EV charging is one good for customers because it's cheap electricity and it's clean electricity. And then it's also good for us as a company and our grid and the rest of the customer base that isn't driving EV as a whole because that electricity is now taking place off peak or overnight and not during the day increasing electricity prices. Um, so I'll first, I know we want to get into home charging, uh, Steve, as you mentioned, um, a lot of great information questions on that, but I'll first go through um, public, our public charging plans and then fleets, and then uh, we'll spend a little bit more time on uh, home charging. And so our, our public charging roadmap is that we're really wanting to support like new mobility services and, and kind of reduce the range anxiety factor that we may have when we're you know, driving uh, you know, one plus hours away from the city. Um, so how we're doing that is through community public charging and then corridor fast charging. That's really where we're putting a lot of our focus. Um, specifically for some of the Minnesota fleet pilots that we actually filed at the Public Utilities Commission last year, um, nearly 23 million, or actually yeah, a little bit over $23 million worth of capital investment of ours that we're putting towards these um, community public charging and uh, corridor fast charging programs. And so one example of the community public charging is we're partnering with the city of St. Paul, the city of Minneapolis, and our car to actually install the electrical wiring and infrastructure needed to power uh, an our car fleet of electric vehicles. And that's just um, community car sharing, um, if you're not familiar with our, the our car um, entity. Uh, and then corridor fast charging, you know, where we want to know where um, a lot of our, our customers are, are driving around our service territory and where we can help um, kind of the corridor fast charging plans. And that directly relates to the MPCA grants um, that are out there through the Volkswagen settlement. Um, I can talk a little bit more about that um, as well in that we can, um, you know, coming soon there'll be some open enrollment for uh, some of our funding to actually build out that infrastructure in support of some of those developments. So how that model actually works and where our utility investment is going um, is in the red portion at the top there. Um, you know, right here, uh, the transformer service and meter, that is kind of traditional service as a utility. That's how we've been doing business for you know the last hundreds of years. So we're owning and operating and maintaining that equipment and making sure that it's reliable and working. Well, we can extend that service. It's the same thing that we've been doing, but we're just extending it a little bit past the meter to really reduce those upfront infrastructure costs to make EV charging possible. And a lot of that upfront cost um, starts with that EV supply infrastructure with um, upgraded panel equipment and the actual like wiring needed to charge. And so that investment, the 23 million, a portion of that will be going to public charging in communities and corridors to help reduce those costs and, and really um, you know, get the public charging out there. A little bit on fleets. 
Um, I mentioned that there's just um, you know, one of the key barriers is lack of awareness and education on, on the information needed to make the transition. And so the first part of how we're um, helping our fleet operators is really with the upfront analytics understanding their current fleet um, of vehicles and which vehicles of that fleet are actually best suited to transition to electric. Um, you, you may have been familiar with some of the, the pilots we did last year with um, 11 entities and actually 10 communities, City, City of Edina, Hastings, Faribault, uh, St. Louis Park, just to name a few. Uh, we actually worked with Fleet Karma, a telematics company to install tracking devices in 20 of the vehicle, uh, 20 fleet vehicles of each of those fleets. And those devices would actually track the vehicles, um, you know, mileage um, uh, and, and trips, understanding uh, its gas mileage, idling time. And then Fleet Karma would take all that data that's been aggregated for six months, generate a report and spit out recommendations for which of those vehicles are actually best suited to transition to electric. So that informed our, our fleet operators in those entities, one, which vehicles, two, how much uh, environmental or, or carbon you know, they may expect to be saving as a lot of those communities have um, sustainability plans. And then three, economically, how it makes sense and what they can see in total uh, operating savings over the life of that new electric car by making the switch. Um, so that upfront provides the fleet operator with a good understanding of, hey, you know, this 2002 Ford Taurus, we can get rid of this one and switch it to electric, or actually we can get rid of this Ford Taurus and not get a new vehicle because it's not being driven that much. So it's really helping fleet operators um, become just more um, aware of their, their, their current operations. Um, so from like the, those um, telematic services and kind of advice and recommendations, we then kind of move to the next segment, similar to public infrastructure, where we can help buy down the costs of installing that infrastructure for our fleet operators and their garages and facilities. So similar to public, um, that electric vehicle supply infrastructure, the panel, the conduit, and the wiring, um, that's where we're looking to invest as well um, to help our, um, our, our fleets um, and just make it easy for them to make the switch. Um, so it's really becoming more economical and easier for them to do so. Any questions on like fleets or public charging before we kind of jump into home? Okay. Um, great. Well, charging at home, similar kind of uh, plans there <clears throat> in, in what we're really doing. Um, as a whole, we want this to be easy, affordable, and clean. And how we're doing it today is increasing awareness and offering advisory services. Um, maybe some of you have been on our website lately in the electric vehicle section. That's actually kind of hard to find today. <laughs> we're working on that. Um, but we have this EV advisor tool that's actually kind of a recommendation quiz. And it tells you what, uh, what electric cars <clears throat> you're actually best suited for, given some of the lifestyle inputs that you provide. How many miles you drive a day? where you park your vehicle, um, space, or like kind of wants or interests and need considerations such as space, seat, uh, space and seating, um, price, um, you know, towing capacity, et cetera. Um, all, that, all those inputs are, are kind of um, provided by uh, uh, the quiz taker, and then we spit out um, some results similar to the fleets of what vehicle makes sense for you. Um, it's kind of like a match score recommendation. So highly encourage that, that EV advisor if you're really looking to explore what types of electric cars are out there today, um, you know, their, their total range, how far they can drive on one, on one charge, so to speak, um, you know, really what you'll be, actually be able to see um, in total um, you know, cost of ownership savings. Uh, we just added a feature there that will compare um, a similar gas vehicle to the recommended electric car that was generated for you. And then also on the environmental uh, on the environmental side too, what you can see for reduced emissions. Yeah. Is that specific to vehicles that you can purchase in Minnesota, or is that broader? It is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the list, uh, the top vehicles are really focused on which vehicles are actually available here today. But then we also list the other vehicles that may not be available um, in Minnesota just because of you know, there's interest of manufacturers to get those vehicles mm -hmm. to those F states, their zero emission vehicle states where they have mandates to sell electric. Because um, 
some of our customers actually do cross borders <laughs> to go get the vehicle they want and drive it back. Um, so that's a that's an interesting concept and definitely available for everyone. Um, so that's kind of the advisory service. Other things that we're doing, as telling Steve earlier, um, we're actually sponsoring the 2020 Twin Cities Auto Show um, this coming year. We did this last year as well, but we're working with our dealership network, um, uh, White Bear Mitsubishi, some of the Nissan dealers, um, uh, Jaguar Minneapolis, Audi Minneapolis, to actually bring their electric vehicle models to the auto show and give people a firsthand experience of test driving the car. Um, there will also have an EV garage where you can kind of walk around and see what it would look like in, in your garage, kind of simulating that experience, all the wiring and the charger, and how much that that, that may cost for you. Um, so definitely recommend checking out the auto show this year um, if that's of interest. Um, second area focuses again on like the infrastructure um, with our home charging service programs. And so there we're looking to make uh, it easy for you to charge your vehicle at home immediately when you come home with your vehicle from the dealership. And so we're working a lot with our dealer partners to see how we can actually make that transition really easy from the point of sale. So right away when you leave the dealership, um, you have an idea of how you're going to be filling your car. Today, that really doesn't happen. And that's what we've seen as a, as a potential barrier for the transition to electric is people drive off the lot with their car and actually the dealer may not have informed them or they just didn't do some research to understand um, how to charge their car. Um, so with those uh, infrastructure home charging programs, um, we're looking to um, uh, uh, basically provide you with the, with the charger in a, in a turnkey, um, you know, hassle-free service where we're sending out our vetted electrician partners to install the charger for you, set it up. Um, they're smart EV chargers, so they're Wi-Fi enabled. You can connect them to your phone for convenience. It's a level two charger, so it's faster charging times um, overnight. Um, and so it's a really attractive program in that um, you don't really have to think about it too much. Um, it will help you through that process. And then immediately when you have that charger installed, you get access to cheaper electricity prices for charging your electric car overnight. Um, and so that's the pilot that we are still running today that we had launched last year for 100 EV participants uh, in Minnesota. Um, we'll dive definitely in, uh, more into that, some of the results, uh, as well as kind of what's coming up um, uh, a little bit as well. And then the last area is, again, kind of how it relates to incentivizing the charging to take place overnight, because that's when, again, electricity is cheapest and we have a lot of uh, clean energy on our system. So optimizing that for everyone. So the service pilot, um, expanding more on that. Um, when we launched it last year in August, we had kind of three main objectives, as this was a new type of service for us as a utility, um, owning and operating um, equipment beyond you know, the traditional setting of the electric meter. Um, and so a lot of things that we wanted to accomplish and test. The first was to um, confirm if there was actually upfront <coughs> installation and cost savings from this new delivery model. Um, I have another slide on that that can actually, you, know, you can see the comparison on upfront cost savings that uh, we uncovered. But why there are upfront cost savings in that is, is because traditionally, before we launched this pilot, in order for an EV driver um, of ours to gain access to those really cheap electric prices for charging overnight, uh, you'd have to install a separate service and separate meter. And what we learned and uncovered from you know, speaking with our customers is that it actually costs a lot of money to do that in most cases, on average around $3,500. And so if you want to charge affordably overnight with that um, incentivized rate, um, that upfront cost is really discouraging a lot of our customers to do so. And so one, we wanted to reduce that barrier um, and make it easier and more affordable for our customers. The second was improve the customer experience. I kind of elaborated on that a little bit earlier with how we're working with dealerships and really recommending actual charging options and the best way to install this infrastructure in your home. Um, we want to provide you know, that hassle-free um, uh, solution for our customers so that it's really easy to make the transition to electric um, after you decide which vehicle um, you'd like to go with. And then the third was we had really had no idea how this technology would perform in the field. Um, level two chargers 
um, that we're using in this program, again, our Wi-Fi and mobile app ena enabled, and actually have energy monitoring technology embedded within them. And so that's how we were um, actually able to recover your energy, or our participants' energy usage from that charger, because it's now acting as the meter. And it's sending data up through the um, participants' Wi-Fi network and then over to us so we can collect that and build it accurately and accordingly. So we had really no idea how it would perform, how Wi-Fi would perform um, with this technology. Um, uh, and then so, yeah, we wanted to maintain you know, safety and reliability and billing accuracy as, you know, that's really standard across everything that we do um, as a company. To address the first one, we did find that this did save a lot of money for customers, which we're very happy to see. Um, this graph is really depicting what those savings look like, and we learned a lot um, because we <coughs> went into a little bit over 100 participants' homes and conducted kind of this estimate and in, in actual installation for this equipment. And so there are a lot of scenarios um, that we came across that provided us good information because who knows that everyone's house is completely different um, for electrical wiring, um, depending on when it was built, um, the upgrades that it's had over time. So it was never the same installation scenario, or generally never the same installation scenario, um, participant after participant. And so what this graph is showing here on the left is going into the pilot, here's kind of the expected savings, or the estimated savings that we anticipated by providing this program. Um, so before we actually started, um, we did some research and, and spoke with customers, spoke with electricians um, to kind of estimate what the savings may be with this delivery model. And that was around 1800 bucks. Um, we started to carry out the pilot, started to install the infrastructure and get people up and running on the program. How we collected the cost savings was actually through our electrician partners. Um, when they would go to install a station, they would actually quote what it would have costed that customer to participate in the original um, separately metered service. And so those estimates are what's shown um, right here in this tall blue column. Um, and what it actually cost with the pilot, with the, with the level two charger. Um, and that difference was just over $2,000. So on average, um, the 100 participants in the pilot are saving $2,000 in upfront costs. So we saw that as a huge win for providing our customers uh, more affordable access to um, competitive electric rates for charging. A little bit more on like the scenarios. Um, was able to, I mean, we, we basically know um, across like six buckets of, hey, this person's, um, this person's electric panel is in the garage, they have a detached garage, what that might cost to do the wiring in a home. And we're kind of able to generalize that down to two buckets. And that's what the graph here on the right is, is depicting. Um, you know, on the left you have, out of the 100 participants, there are 58, um, there are 58 participants that actually already had the necessary wiring to power the level two charging station. Um, whether that was an existing circuit or where they're, where they're going to be charging is, or where they want to um, mount their charger is actually right next to their service panel in their garage. And so our electrician can basically directly tie and wire that charging station to their service panel without little cost or effort. Um, and so in general, um, those are, that's the cost savings for, uh, for that customer, um, for the cost needed to do that. And then the other ha half of the population actually needed the wiring, and that may have been you know, the electrician punching through walls, um, possible trench work. Um, it's a longer distance between their panel and their charging location. So that was the savings or the cost for the wiring? Uh, that is the savings. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we conducted this pilot, it's still operating today, it was a two year pilot term. Um, but in advance of that, after our analysis and evaluation, um, we really decided that we wanted to get this out to more customers um, sooner than later than the pilot term. So we actually filed uh, this last August at the Minnesota Public Utilities Commission to expand this model and program to an uncapped number of participants in our Minnesota service territory. We actually recently filed a similar program in our Wisconsin service territory on uh, yesterday. Um, so that's definitely, we're really excited to offer that to our Wisconsin customers as well. Um, it's basically the same type of program. The only difference is it's more attractive energy rate um, and a little bit more innovative 
um, in that it's a three-tiered time of use rate instead of a two-tiered from the original pilot. And when I say that, it means um, basically there was only two windows of different electric prices throughout the entire day. So from for the original pilot from 9 p.m. to 9 a.m., um, that is the window for the discounted price. And then during the day, it was a higher electric price if you charge. Um, for this, for the expansion, it's a three-tiered, uh, three-tier windows, and so during the day, it's still the high um, electric price if you charge during the day during on-peak. But then there's a shoulder window uh, where the price is around basically the standard rate around nine cents per kilowatt hour, and then the off-peak window is actually midnight to I think it's um, eight a.m. and um, that price is cheaper than the off-peak price from the original program, um, about a cent and a half cheaper. And so we're excited to offer that as a more competitive um, and cheaper electric rate when you're doing your charging overnight. Um, other learnings from the pilot, actually Wi-Fi was fairly resilient. Um, you know, like your mobile phone, sometimes Wi-Fi goes in and out and disconnects. We did see that in the pilot, but it actually didn't inhibit us from delivering a successful service and billing our customers accurately. Um, in, some, in, in some cases, um, you know, we didn't see data coming in on a daily basis from, from these stations, um, but the stations have the ability to capture 90 days worth of charging. And so when the station would reconnect, we'd get that data and be able to bill accurately. Um, and so at, as a whole, the pilot was very successful and we're excited to move that forward um, and bring it to more customers. So that was kind of information on the pilot. Just in general, I feel like you, know, you as, a, um, as a staff of the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency are probably um, fairly well versed in electric vehicles. And Steve as was mentioning you get, he's done some <laughs> sessions on car buying and benefits of electric vehicles. So this might be some, re um, some refresher. Can I ask you a question yeah, about the pilot? Yeah. So obviously the pilot filled up. Mm -hmm. And I noticed I was online and I saw you could get on a wait list. Mm -hmm. but. Is that to get into the expansion program then? It is, yeah. And so what's the timing of the expansion program? Do you have any idea? We're hoping next year. Um, right now it's at the Public Utilities Commission. And so they're reviewing it right now and we're waiting on, um, the next step is actually the hearing uh, where they deliberate on the program and uh, hear comments from um, other stakeholders. And so that next step, um, no matter what the hearing may be, um, but we're anticipating this pilot being available sometime in uh, uh, later next year in quarter three. Um, and then you talked about um, having the three-tier window, and I think you said it, the shoulder was like nine cents. What is it for the other two, uh, roughly? Yeah, yeah. The uh, on-peak is about 20 cents, 21 cents, I believe. Um, basically the same on-peak price as it was for the pilot. And then the cheaper overnight rate is uh, at 2.7 cents, or 0.27 cents. I have a question. So that higher rate during the day, is that just for the charging station, or is your whole house charged at the higher rate? During just the, the charging station. Okay. Yeah, and so that's the one benefit of this program, is that we're able to separate out and build that usage separately. So if you know, you're know you home during the day, um, or your family is home during the day and using energy, that's not billed at a higher rate, but rather the EV usage and charging is billed on that. Yeah, when I looked on your webpage a few weeks ago, I, when I looked about the off-peak off rates, and then I noticed that the peak rates were higher than the you know, overall normal mm -hmm. standard way you charge, so then I was like, now that, if I'm trying to save money at night, then I'm paying more during the day. Mm -hmm. I, it didn't say anything about you know, if you're charging an electric vehicle, that you would be, you know, split into two things. The charging rate for your car would be higher than your house. So yeah. I, I, could, I didn't see that, so it dissuaded me from being interested in charge. Sure. Yeah, and you might have seen the, so we do have like a whole home option where um, we actually just swap out a meter and then That's the, and then your whole home, no matter what, you know, if you're charging your electric car or your whole home is actually built on that time of use rate. So that's the option that you, that you may have okay. seen then. Um, so we have that available. So I mean, like for my lifestyle, I'm typically not home during the day. And so a lot of my usage could be, you know, I could shift it to the off grade. Right? And then do you use the home's Wi-Fi network or does it have, does the meter have its own 
like hotspot. Uh, for the whole home, or the, the the charger. For the charger. Yeah, it uses the, the home Wi-Fi network, so it doesn't have hotspot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. For for like the overnight charging, are you relying on the the, the timer on the car, or does the you, do you have like smart meters where it only turns on when you tell it to? Or yeah, so we're actually relying on the charger. Um, so since it's app enabled, um, when we in, when our electrician installers install. Um, the charger, they actually walk through with you on your mobile phone how to set the schedule. And then if you ever, you know, in the instance that you do need to charge during the day, uh, it's just kind of one click within the mobile application um, to start charging now. So if you do need to, you know, participants do have that opportunity to override the charging schedule. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah. Um, when I was looking at an option for, for to see if this is the right idea, the rule of thumb seemed to be if, if the rest of your electrical usage is below a certain amount, then it's not really worth doing. And it turns out we have a ground source heat pump, which is on a separate meter that Excel required us to have, and we get charged something like 40% less for because you have control over the device if you need to at peak times, so which is fine. Mm -hmm. um, and so that has reduced our electrical use, a regular electric use, considerably. So now we are below that threshold that Excel says you need to get before it makes sense to have a time of use rate. Right. And that, yeah, and you mentioned it, you know, for your whole home as well. Um, but if you have an electric car, you know, I still think it makes sense for you to get get that cheaper rate through kind of that separate, you know, the separate. Use. Like a separate, mm -hmm. right. separate I, I think if there was a three tier system, I would revisit that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Another question so the ground source heat pump is on that separate meter, and I had been dying to find out if that would allow us to hook our charger to that meter because it's a, it's a cheaper rate and you can control it if you needed to. But the answer I got was we couldn't do that. Yeah, I think if I'm recalling our like the rate terms, I believe it's only. Um, you know that specific ground source heat pump load can be on okay. on that uh, that separate meter. But, uh, well, the good news is though that I mean compared to gas, the right. my wife and I are spending way less anyway, even though we're paying the regular rate for Excel. So it's a mm -hmm. it's a sweet deal anyway. <laughs> well, you bring up you bring up a really good point though. Is, you know, there's all these other technologies that are available to us as consumers of energy. Um, and so one thing that we're working on is trying to marry up all these new technologies you know, into kind of a bundled solution for our customers to figure out, you know, how can we kind of tie, you know, this unique technology that one participant may have in their home, um, you know, to electric vehicles. When you think of, you know, solar battery storage and then EVs kind of all into one um, just because they're basically all almost, you know, separate energy resources. You know, an electric car is just a bigger battery. Um, so how do those kind of play together and how can we provide an offering for our, our customers who are interested in both? So I've got two apps. I've got one for the, the juice box mm -hmm. and then I got one for the Chevy Bolt. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can look at tire pressure and unlock the doors if you need to, but um, I mean, who knows, we're going to have five or six apps for all these things. If, I was going to say, would it be all be easier if it was just on one? <laughs> right, right. I mean, finding some uniformity yeah. actually is probably going to help. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, question about, so like you just mentioned, your vehicle is another battery. Um, so that's, you know, uh, it could be a, a grid storage mm -hmm. device. Um, is that something that Excel has been, you know, digging into or? Yeah, absolutely. It's on our radar. Um, we're right now kind of working through exploring what a vehicle to grid pilot may look like. And we'll probably be testing that first with um, larger battery vehicle vehicles like buses, school buses. Um, so we have been in conversation with some bus, electric bus manufacturers on that um, to see when we can actually get that started. Bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> Let's, Let's go, go right? Yeah. We want to move quick as well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
from yesterday. Exciting times, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I think you know, it goes without saying, um, but you know, top reasons that people are driving electric today is the cost savings. You know, there's less maintenance on an electric vehicle. The fuel that is um, charging them is significantly cheaper than gas, and it's not as volatile, so you know what you're going to be paying on a month to month basis for your transportation needs. Environmental benefits, you've seen that in earlier slides as well. Um, how instantly when you transition to an electric vehicle, because our grid is so clean um, today, um, there's instant environmental savings there. And then they're fun to drive. Um, I, I've driven a few of them through the riding drives that we facilitate. Um, you know, the instant torque and power that you get from them is definitely um, not as comparable to a traditional vehicle. Um, we drove our Chevy Volt over here today. Um, so I always try to reserve that one when we're going to offsite meetings because it's super fun to drive. Um, so definitely encourage you to check that out or visit a local dealer, um, just to name a few. And you, you'll see um, that we have partnerships with Nissan and then Mitsubishi on uh, factory rebates for Exxon Energy employees and customers. Um, and so Klein Nissan and White Bear, Eden Prairie Nissan are, are two of our top partners um, for Nissan. And then uh, White Bear Mitsubishi. Um, is our is our top partner for for that vehicle. Um, so if you're interested in those, uh, take a look. I'm a shameless plug for what I just mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> um, so those brochures are on the table. Feel free to um, you know, walk away with those if you're if you're considering. That's all I have. Um, it was a lot. Thanks for hanging in there, and thanks again for having me, Steve, and uh, the rest of you guys. Really appreciate it. Um, if you have more questions too, feel free to come up and chat with us, um, or you can email uh, this inbox as well. That actually goes directly to me, so <laughs> direct email to me. Um, yeah, definitely excited for uh, the future as, as we continue to build it, and um, excited to see where it takes us. Um, you said there was a hearing with the PUC, but you don't know when it is. Is there a way to find out when that is? Um, no, okay. <laughs> I don't think I don't think for um, there possibly maybe for for you know public just or the, or if there's a public comment period I guess is where I'm going with that yeah it's like you could submit comments other ways yeah it's not yeah period. and I think the public comment period may have actually just ended but I mean that will um, I'd have to look back at the timeline as all reply comments for that program were recently submitted. Um, and so um, that next opportunity, you know, would be would be at the hearing. Um, but the docket number, if you're curious, I'm looking it up, is um, 19 hyphen five nine nine or five five nine. Sorry, excuse me. Um, I, I have a question. Yeah. So, so um, is everyone kind of getting their own like custom? Uh, approach like in terms of like the amperage of the installed charger is it always like a NEMA 1450 plug or um, you know like depending on the person's needs and daily mileage that factors into what they're actually getting in their house yeah so um, what we want to get to our point that we want to get to is actually recommending you know if you're driving a plug-in hybrid vehicle half electric half gas and you know, depending on what the range of that vehicle is and how much you're actually driving in some cases, it really just makes sense for you to plug into level one um, and perhaps not even be on the time of use rate, because um, that just may be economically better for you mm -hmm. um, without having to go through the upfront installation costs needed to get higher, um, you know, higher power charging. But that's a decision that you kind of have to make for yourself too, is like, hey, do I want that convenience to, again, fuel up my vehicle faster in some cases? You know, overnight charging is definitely the best because that's the longest time that your vehicle is just sitting um, and available to charge and typically level one will be able to, um, to do that for plug-in hybrid vehicles. Yeah, different story for fully electric vehicles is, you know, we definitely recommend level two um, just for that convenience because your vehicle is solely relying on electricity. Um, and so um, what we're doing for kind of the, the custom installation side is, well, depending on where your panel is and um, you know, where your charging location is, uh, we want to kind of give you an estimate of what that is going to cost. And then our electrician partners um, you know, who have been doing this for a really long time can come and provide you with that personalized advice and actually install and say, okay, here's how it's actually going to cost, and here's what we're going to do for you. 
Um, and so that's kind of the, the custom installation. All the chargers are hardwired, and that actually does reduce some of the cost as well, um, because in Minnesota, it's uh, required that you have GFI protection, and that does add um, some upfront installation costs. And so the hardwiring um, provides some added safety um, and also lowers some of the costs there. Okay. Uh, you had a figure um, of how much e gallons or um, like it was a dollar. Yeah. Then, um, yeah. yeah, I think it was two slides back, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, what, you know, what is that figure based on? Is that the, the program? that you were talking about, so mm -hmm. charging on all off-peak hours? This is uh, generalized, just on making the transition to electric. Um, and so that's if you know, you're not on a specific you know, electric rate um, with the overnight charging. If you do go to that, it's actually less than a dollar um, and, and closer to about 30, in the, in the range of like 30 to 50 cents. Per, per e gallon. And so yeah, that's really meant to you know equate you know the price of, of driving an electric to what it would be for a gas vehicle. Does that help answer? Yeah. Um, if you do your your program, are you automatically on like a hundred percent renewables plan or um, like I'm on Connexus for example? And, sure. But they require us to like put a, a meter a sub meter in and do that more expensive yeah. installation. So, but but they say like you're gonna get a hundred percent dedicated wind energy mm -hmm. to charge your car. Yeah. So when you roll out that program, you will have an option to opt in to basically supply all your EV charging with clean energy, and um, that's through our, our wind source and renewable connect programs. And it's basically almost the price of a latte a month um, for that you know clinic benefit. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you can also do that for your whole home, too. Cool. Yeah. Uh, do you need to use one of your electricians to do the install, or can you have somebody do it? Yeah, so to set up the and hardwire the station um, and program it on your phone, that is required for our, our electricians. Um, but you can actually, you know, if you don't have the circuit ready, you can do that yourself, or you can do that for your preferred electrician. You know, we'll provide you that option for that type of work. As that cost is outside of the program cost, um, I should have actually mentioned this. Um, the program cost. There's two different options to pay um, for the charger itself and the installation hardwiring of it, and then the actual maintenance. It's a full um, warranty program, and so if your charger breaks, we'll come out and fix it, swap it out, uh, etc. And so for that, you can either pay monthly, and it's on your bill or you can pay for the charger and installation up front, and then you still pay monthly for like the maintenance and service part. So if you really want no upfront cost, um, it's basically zero um, for the charger and installation. All you have to do is, this, is pay for the circuit, and then on a monthly basis, um, you, you pay for the, the charger installation and um, the maintenance and service for it. What's the average cost for that? Monthly cost. So we, what we propose with the expansion, it's uh, just a little bit over sixteen dollars a month, and then um, if you prepay, it'll be around seven seventy, and then the monthly fee is a little bit over six dollars. And so when you think about your phone bill, which is mine's super high, I don't know about you guys, um, that is basically nothing. <laughs> um, so and when you're paying for all that with your fuel, it's really competitive. I um, mean, you know. If you're the average driver and you're driving 12,000 miles a year, um, you're looking at a, at a monthly bill of around like 40 bucks. Any other questions? Yeah, that's it. We can wrap it up and whatnot. Okay. Um, th thanks again, Neil, and uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Thanks again for coming in yeah, and sure. sharing everything with us. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it.